dear friends in Christ, grace to you in peace. Amen. Did you hear those references to fear in that story of Peter walking on the water? You know, you know that story, you've read it many times, but we've been highlighting different portions of it just as a way of kind of picking apart or picking into some of the nuances of the story that I think are, are, are very insightful in this, in this important story. For Peter and the disciples, obviously they, they told this story around a campfire many times. Remember when you were a Boy Scout or Girl Scout and said, remember when? And then you'd tell the story. Well, probably as they told this story over time, the hair bristled on their neck every time they heard it, remembering those feelings of fear of that wind and that rain on that lake. And notice Jesus' response to Peter addresses that fear. Jesus says to him, take heart, it's I, don't be afraid, do not fear, is what Jesus says, words that came into Peter's fear. Did you know that that's the most common command in the Bible? Do not fear, do not be afraid. That command is all over in the Bible. In fact, it's the most common command that there is in the Bible. The most common command isn't, love your neighbor as yourself, or don't cheat on your taxes, or come to church, or be nice to your pastor. That is in there a lot, of course, you know that. But the, the, the command, do not be afraid, do not fear, appears more than any other command in the Bible. In fact, every time there's an angelic um, experience, anytime people come into the presence of God with an angel or the word of God, the common response is that they're terrified and the first word of the angel or of God is don't be afraid. Remember at Christmas, it's all over in the Christmas story when the angels appear, they're terrified. And the angel says, do not be afraid. There's about 360 references to do not be afraid, one for every day of the year. One for every day of the year, do not be afraid, do not fear. I think that the Bible's number one command is, is do not be afraid, do not fear, is because um, I think when people come into an experience with God, whatever that might be, however that might take place, whenever you're really in the presence of God or experience God in a deeply personal way, it, it kind of scares the pants off you. And you think, oh my goodness, you're afraid. And the first word of God is, don't be afraid, I'm the God who brought the ancient people out of Israel, I'll bring you through what you are dealing with. Fear is often a response when we come into the presence of God, because oftentimes God is calling us to do something that we don't want to do. Be more faithful, be overcoming of the sin problem, whatever it might be, God often calls us to do something that we're maybe not willing or able to do, and so our first response is fear, because when we come into the presence of God, it sometimes paralyzes us or, or um, immobilizes us. We don't quite know what to do, and so we're filled with fear, and so the words, fear not, give us courage to go out and maybe do what God is calling us to do. The disciples were in the boat, they saw Jesus, they heard the words of Jesus, but they were immobilized they were paralyzed and they remained as boat potatoes in the boat rather than responding to the invitation of Jesus to come to him walking on the water. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about Peter walking on water, how hope got him out of the boat, trust held him up, but fear sank him. Hope got him out of the boat, trust held him up, but fear sank him. Now we're going to take a little rabbit trail and return Peter in a moment, but I'd like to direct our attention to our first lesson for today, the story of David and Goliath. Another story of fear and overcoming fear. Actually, in our Wednesday Bible study, we talked about this last Wednesday, 1 Samuel 17, and it's still kind of so fresh in my mind all week that... I didn't get everything said at the Bible study, so I wanted to share a little bit more with you about that and how that ties into the story of Peter walking on the water. The story of David and Goliath is an epic story. 
It's probably one of five stories in the Bible that everyone around the world knows whether they're Christian or Jewish or not. You know, the story of Noah and the flood and Adam and Eve and the cross and the story of David and Goliath. It's an epic story. It has, it has lessons that we can learn. It's used often in the business world about, you know, the David company overcoming the Goliath, the Goliath company. It's a story of triumph over adversity, of meeting challenges head on, of facing your fears and your giants in your life. It's an epic biblical story. When a story starts David, and when David met Goliath, David was a kid. David was just a kid. And he wasn't in the army, though his older brothers were. And in the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel, um, the army of Israel was encamped on one side of a hill with the valley of Elah in between, and the Philistines were on the other side of the hill. They were set to engage in battle. The problem was that the evil Philistines had this warrior, this ox of a man, this giant whose name was Goliath. Goliath was big, bad, and ugly. I mean, he was one ugly dude, and he was huge. He was over nine feet tall. He had a massive bronze helmet around his size 17 head. He wore a coat of armor that was made of ringlets of bronze that went from his shoulder to his knees. It weighed, those shekels are referred to in the Old Testament, it weighs about 175 pounds. He had bronze leggings to protect his legs and his feet. He had a bronze spear with a head on it about the size and weight of a bowling ball. And besides all that, Notice he had a shield carrier, right, Lori, who walked in front of him, size of an average guy, that had a shield about the size of the whole body, shielding anything that would get through to Goliath. Goliath was huge and big, bad, and ugly. And not only that, but this Goliath was a bully. He'd go out and yell at the people of Israel with his big, bad, ugly breath, you bunch of sissies, why don't you want, why, just send one of you guys out for battle. I'll do battle with him, and then if he wins, we'll surrender. If he loses, then we'll sur You know what I mean. If he wins, we'll surrender to you. If I win, you surrender to us. Day after day, morning after morning, this big, bad, ugly giant would taunt the people of Israel, and they cowered and shrank behind the rocks on the side of the hill, because no way were they going to send anybody out to face Goliath. David was a small kid. David was not in the army, though his older brothers were. David was the youngest son of a family of eight sons. And he was home tending the, shep, tending the sheep in the little town of Bethlehem. At home with his mom and his dad going home for dinner every night. One day, Jesse, his father, Jesse is the father, a root from the stump of Jesse. Um, Jesse says, David, you know, why don't you go to your brothers and bring them some roasted grain and ten loaves of bread and a bunch of cheese to your brothers. So David, that morning, get, puts on his North Face backpack and he put a bunch of Happy Meals in there and he goes off to his brothers on the front lines who were out there hiding behind those rocks wanting to do battle but not willing to step onto the battlefield with Goliath. And just as David gets up to the front line and finds his brothers, Big Bad Goliath was out there shaking that bowling ball of a spear and saying, you bunch of sissies, how come nobody will come out and fight me? As the people, the soldiers, are running back to their rocks, David says to a couple of the soldiers, hey, what can be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And David, young, small, shepherd boy David, says, Give me the chance to go up against this big, bad, ugly giant. 
God has been with me before and God will be with me now. Remember God was with him before when he slayed the lion and the bear? You know, with his bare hands, God was with him and he said, God will be with me. So somehow they took up David on his offer. David goes down to the stream, chooses five smooth stones from the bubbling brook, puts them in his pouch, and went off to face the fearful Goliath. You know the story, Goliath ridiculed young David. Goliath came to David with all of his armor on, with his shield bearer protecting him, and notice the words he says. Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? The reason he said that is that the Philistines entered into the Iron Age long before the people of Israel did. So they had spears, they had bronze ringlets to make this great big armor. They had leggings made out of bronze that they had hammered out. They had iron around their chariot wheels so that they could go through things. In fact, they even had, kind of like Ben-Hur had, those swords on their chariots so that they went through armies, they would cut the other people down because they entered into the Iron Age long before the people of Israel. So he says, so what do you come at me with sticks? With your stones that are chiseled into spears? Who are you against me? And David, David says, I come to you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God whom you have defiled. This day the God will hand you over to me so that the entire world may know that it's not me who slays you, but God himself. David took, takes that one small stone, puts it in his sling, swings it faster than he ever had with a prayer in his heart. He let it go. It struck Goliath in the forehead. Goliath's eyes crossed, his knees buckled, he crumples to the ground face first and died. Little small David with this one smooth stone, but with the power of God in his life, in his mind, in his heart, took down this great big band giant who struck fear into people's hearts. You know, it's not this nice little Sunday school tale, this story of David and Goliath. It's a story of God's power and presence and God's ability to slay Goliath the giant. It's, yeah, it's a story of a young boy armed with five smooth stones who went out and slay a giant with what he had, with what was most natural to him. Saul had offered him his armor. David said, that's not me. It's just not me. Let me just go with what I have, with my natural capabilities, with the uh, resources that I have. Let me go out and protect the people of Israel. And with God's power, David was able to slay this fearful giant in his life. You know, it's not just a nice little small Sunday school tale, the story of David and Goliath. It's about us. It's about you and it's about me. It's about giants that we face in our lives. Think about that. What are the giants you face in your life? I mean, we all, we all have them when we take some time to think about them. What are the giants that you face in your life? When, if you're a kid, maybe it's a bully on a playground or in a neighborhood when you get ready to retire or not retire. Maybe it's financial pressure. Maybe it's a giant of job security. Maybe it's a giant of parenting teenagers today and kind of not knowing what to do. Maybe it's loneliness. Maybe it's heartache. Maybe it's moral failure. Maybe it's impending surgery. Maybe it's hospitalization. Maybe it's just insecurity about measuring up. What are the giants that you face in your life? Think about that, that giant in your life that causes you fear and anxiety, that causes you to cringe every time you think about it. That giant, that anxiety or that fear when you wake up at night and you just can't go back to sleep because it keeps looming over you and you've tried to face it before but you can't, you failed and this giant or this issue or this challenge is just something that you can't get past. Maybe you cringe from it. That's what David's brothers were doing. The people of Israel and their army were cringing, hiding behind the stones because their Goliath, 
their giant was too much for them, so they just, they had to put up with it because there was nothing else that they could do. So finish this sentence, maybe complete the sentence, maybe even this afternoon on a note card or a post-it note or something, right, right at the top of it, my giant is, and then complete the sentence. My giant is, relationship problem, health problem, financial problem, sin problem, what is it that, what giant is causing anxiety in, in your life that wakes you up at night? What's disappointing you? What is depressing you? What hurt do you have in your heart? I mean, write down on a post-it note, that my giant is, but then on that same post-it note, right at the bottom, but my God is bigger. But my God is bigger. God is bigger than any fear or anxiety or giant in your life. My God is bigger. Always remember that. Because that's what David, young David knew, with that sling in his hand, the small, smooth stone, when he went against Goliath, his giant, and with a prayer in his heart, knowing that his God was bigger than Goliath, he overcame Goliath. But my God is bigger than my giant Goliath. Back on the shores of this, back in the Sea of Galilee, <coughs> the giant was the wind and the waves and the lightning and the thunder and the lion and the tigers and the bears, and they were filled with anxiety and very fearful. So Peter says, hey, Lord, if it's you, ask me to come out to you on the water. Jesus says, come. And in the midst of this fearful storm, Peter begins to walk on the water. But when he looked at the giant, when he became aware of the wind, he began to sink. And thinking that he was going to be defeated and sink, he cried out, Lord, save me, because my giants are defeating me. And Jesus held him up. Hope got him out of the boat. Trust held him up. But fear sank him. Jesus caught him, and notice what he said. This is interesting. He says, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? You have little faith. Why did you doubt? Think of that sentence. What, 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 what was Jesus asking Peter when he said, why did you doubt? I mean, what did Peter doubt? What, what did Peter doubt? Who did Peter doubt? Maybe a word of a grace in this story is that Jesus believed that Peter could walk on water. Jesus wouldn't have invited Peter out on water if he knew that Peter would sink immediately. Jesus knew that Peter could walk on water, overcome his fear, and defeat this giant of a storm. Who did Peter doubt? Why did you doubt? Maybe, just maybe, Peter doubted himself. Peter doubted himself. In the midst of the giant storm he was facing, my giant is this fearful storm, he doubted himself in his ability to walk on that water. It's too much, it's too big, I can't do it. I'm gonna fold, I'm gonna sink, and that's what he did. We talk a lot about believing in Jesus, obviously central to what it is for us as Christians. But what about Jesus believing in us? What about Jesus believing in us. Jesus believed in Peter, but Peter didn't believe in himself. Peter did not believe in himself. Hope got him out of the boat, trust held him up, fear sank him. God believed in David, and fascinating, different kind of story, David believed in himself, and that hope that David had in God allowed him to take those five stones Trust caused him to sling them, and Goliath was the one who sank to his knees in defeat. David knew that I can do all things through him who strengthens me, right? How many times have we talked about that? David, I mean, it's a, it's a New Testament saying, David could have said all the same thing. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It's a theme that runs throughout the Bible. This story of Peter is a, is, a, is a great story. We've already spent four weeks on it. We're going to spend two more weeks on some of these nuances in the story. But with the fear that's in there, don't let your fears of the giants in your life defeat you. 
the storms, the giants, the problems, the challenges, the fears that keep you in at night. Don't give in and let them defeat you because believe in God, believe in hope and trust in God that you can overcome your fears in following Jesus who invites you out to the stormy seas, walking to him, focusing on him, letting your eyes meet him and responding to that invitation to come to him on the water because he's out there inviting you. And remember, if you want to walk on the water, you've got to get out of the boat. Let's close in prayer.